So the last time we met, we talked about the Greek myth, I believe. Is that correct? We talked about Horus and Isis and... Okay, good. So... I want to talk to you about this symbol today. Which reminds me, there's another slide that I need to use to do that. This took me a long time to sort out. It, it looks to me like mythology uses two classic myth, and the symbols that are associated with classic myth, use two different symbols to represent the unknown. And one of them, as far as I can tell, represents the absolute unknown. And so that would be things that... It's a complicated conceptual category. All these are, because otherwise they would be articulated and explicit categories instead of imagistic and artistic categories. And so, they're trying to... The symbols express a very large variety of things that are difficult to formulate into an explicit set. Now, one of the theories that Jung had about symbols, which I really like, it's different than the Freudian idea. Now, Freud believed that your mind produced symbols to represent content that you repressed, basically. <clears throat> and maybe it does that from time to time. But Jung thought of the symbol in a different way. He thought of it as something that floated up from the depths, so to speak. I actually think that's the right way of thinking about it. Like a dream. Now, we don't really know much about consciousness. It's, it's proved very elusive to scientific study. And we don't really know much about the process by which the understanding of very complex concepts comes about. Although we've started to take that apart to some degree in the class. You're often confronted with things that you don't understand and can't control. And it's necessary to categorize those because you have to figure out how to deal with them. And we've already established the proposition that most human categories that are that are fundamental are associated with action rather than, than representation. Or you could think, in some sense, that the action is the representation, right? Which, which would mean, you might say, well, what's a monster? Or we could even do something simpler. We could say, what's a chair? And I could say, well, a, a chair could be a beanbag, and a chair could be a stump. And then you might ask, well, a chair and a, a, a beanbag and a stump have virtually nothing in common, apart from the fact that they're both made out of matter. They're very dissimilar entities, yet you can encapsulate them under the same heading. And the reason for that is because you can sit on them. And so the category is actually predicated on the use. And we've talked about the idea that we categorize things as, as tools, or, or that we categorize them in relationship to their, their implication for action. Now... There were mammalian creatures around between 60 and 220 million years ago, which is a very long time. It's, it's long enough for those mammals to have been overlapping with dinosaurs quite nicely. And, you know, our early ancestors were quite small and easily preyed upon, and then our later ancestors were tree-dwelling primates, and then they were ground-dwelling primates, and now we're city-dwelling primates, you know. And there was a tremendously long period where we were preyed on things that came in from the outside. That's one way of looking, about, looking at it. And from this perspective, a monster is something that's predatory, and that comes out from outside, and that's something you don't expect, and that inhabits unexplored territory, and something that you don't understand. It's all of those things at once. And then, to the, to the degree that the psyche <clears throat> is transpersonal, which means to the degree that your mind is capable, <coughs> excuse me, 
that the concepts that your mind uses to organize the world are an expression of a heritable structure, then it's reasonable to propose that you have an inbuilt representation of something like the predator. But it's more complicated in human beings. Now, you might say, well, is there any evidence for that? Because it, you know, Jung's ideas of archetypes of the collective unconscious has never really been accepted by general psychologists. A lot of biological psychologists are interested in it, by the way, because they're much more familiar with the idea of built-in instinct and action pattern. And instincts and action patterns that are built in can be unbelievably complicated. And we do know, for example, that rats that are never exposed to a cat in their life will still panic if you waft cat odor over their domicile. So rats do not like the smell of cats, and they don't have to learn that. For a long time, psychologists believed that you learn fear through conditioning. And then there was an idea that there were prepared, that there were certain fears were prepared so you could learn them more easily. So for example, if I wanted to condition a fear response to you and I showed you a picture of a snake and associated it with a small electric shock, compared to if I associated it with a picture, say, of a, a daisy or even a pistol, which is also a dangerous thing, obviously, you're going to learn to be conditioned to the snake much faster. So that's sort of the weak version of prepared categorization, but there's stronger versions of prepared categorization too, and I, I actually think they're correct. And I, ca I can't see why they wouldn't be. The stronger version is that, no, you don't have, your, 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 your apprehension, your alert apprehension, the alert apprehension that you would devote towards something like a predatory reptile is not something that you need to learn at all. You already know how to do it. And I wouldn't say that that's been proven beyond a shadow of a doubt, but, <coughs> but we do know that chimpanzees react with fear to a variety of stimuli that they didn't necessarily come into contact with during their developmental period. So, for example, chimpanzees don't like bodies of chimpanzees that don't move. So if you bring an anesthetized chimp into a group of chimps in a zoo, say, the chimps are not happy about that at all. They also don't like snakes. They don't like even plastic snakes. And they don't like snakes even if they've never seen a snake. And if they see a snake, when, and they never have, they'll get the hell away from the snake, but then they'll turn around and look at it, and look at it, and look at it, and look at it. And in the wild, they do something similar. So if a, if a chimp comes across a snake, a big snake, say, it has a particular noise it makes, which is called a snake ra, and I guess that's a representation of the noise that the chimp makes, but what happens when the chimp makes that noise is all the other chimps will come running, and they'll look at the snake. They're sort of enraptured by the snake, I think is the right way to think about it. I think they're in awe of the snake, to tell you the truth. Um, you might think, well, chimpanzees can't feel awe. It's like, well, don't be so sure. You're a modified chimpanzee, and you can feel awe. And, but there's more to the story than that. You ever listen to a piece of music that makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up? Or a shiver run through you? Is that a familiar experience to people? Has ever, anybody not had that experience? Okay, okay. You're the only person in the whole room. I know. <laughs> huh. Okay, well, maybe, maybe, whatever, whatever. <laughs> The, the shiver, the shiver is a consequence of piloerection. And what that means is that when, when you f have that feeling, you're doing the same thing that a cat does when it puffs out. And the reason that the cat does that it's, is to look big. And the reason it wants to look big is because it sees something that is awe-inspiring. And that's partly, it's, it's an admixture of terror and and. Fascination, yes, that's, that's the right way of thinking about it. But what's interesting about the piloerection response in human beings is it's often manifested to something of great beauty or great excitement. You know? So 
anyways, that, that, that reaction is so old, my point is that reaction is so old that we still have hangovers, biological hangovers from it, so to speak, from the time when it was actually useful for us to puff up our fur, and that was a long time ago. And so I don't think it's unreasonable to presuppose that chimpanzees can feel something like awe. Now, I would also like to point out that awe can be felt to a variety of different things. So, I think that what a low-ranking chimp feels to a very high-ranking chimp is also something akin to awe. And the reason I think that is, well, first because of how low-ranking chimps act around high-ranking chimps. They act subordinate. But also because there has been studies, there have been studies with monkeys, and I think these were done with vervets, although I'm not precisely sure of the breed. They showed vervets troop. They took vervets from a troop, and they showed vervets pictures of the low-ranking, I told you this, the low-ranking vervets, and they showed pictures the vervets pictures of the high-ranking vervets, and the vervets preferred to gaze at the high-ranking vervets. And so the vervets were, the high-ranking vervets were the target of their attention. Now, yes? Is there they knew them. Okay. But there might also be something about them physically. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, we know that human beings can, hypothetically, can look at a, an array of middle-aged men and pick out the CEOs without knowing them. They can do it at better than chance. Now, they're not exactly sure what cues are being used, or maybe they are, and I just don't know the literature well enough. That, that, might, be, that might be part of it. Um, so we do pick up cues of dominance that are, I think they're innate. Wide jaw is one of them. You know, and, and there's weird variations on this too, so I can tell you, for example, if you show women pictures of the same man, and you vary the jaw width, when the women are ovulating, they like the guy with the thick jaw, the heavy jaw, and when they're not, when they're completely opposite to ovulating, they like the guy with the thinner jaw. And so, I mean, I think this is part of the reason that women have trouble with men, actually, because I think that from a sexual perspective, they might be more wired to be attractive to men who produce monstrous sons, but, you know, like powerful, attractive sons, because from an evolutionary perspective, you're much more likely to get a grandchild, or to speak, to speak in a more Darwinian sense, you're more likely to pass on your genes if you have a son who's successful at attracting mates. And there's no reason to assume that the man who will produce sons that's more, more capable of attracting mates is going to be the sort of man, A, that will treat you right, or B, won't fool around. Because basically you're gambling in some sense that your son will have the opportunity to fool around because that's your best bet in terms of moving your genetic material forward. Um, why is it that a wide jaw, they, what is it about a wide jaw? Dominance. Testosterone. Has it uh, been shown that people with wide jaws are actually more... Yes, it's teeth. We bite. So a heavy, more muscular jaw, like people don't anymore, but chimpanzees certainly bite. But are they more dominant in a social sense? Yeah, they are. They are. Wider face is one of the markers, actually. Yeah, yeah. So these are, you know, I wouldn't say they're overwhelmingly powerful effects, but they're detectable, you know. So, and it also goes along, I think, with some things like preference for symmetry, because, you know, there's a higher probability that an asymmetrical person has had something go wrong with them at some point in their biological development. So people find symmetrical people more attractive. And that, that's the truth even for, for creatures like butterflies. So there are butterflies that will not mate with another butterfly, even if they're asymmetrical by almost an unmeasurable amount. So they're very, very attuned to it. I think what this symbol stands for, as far as I can tell, is that which exists beyond our comprehension. And that's, that's different than something unknown. It's different in some ways, anyways. You remember the, remember the hierarchy diagram I, I showed you? I showed you that over and over, right, with the little, you know, the high resolution actions at the bottom and then the really low resolution actions at the top. So, maybe you can think about it this way. 
So the unknown seems to be able to be represented by this serpent, reptile, predatory symbol. It also seems to be able to be represented by the negative feminine, and it also seems to be represented by the positive feminine. And so, maybe, if you think about that hierarchy, what happens is that the trivial novelties, you know, that you encounter whenever you do something wrong that's only a small mistake, those trivial novelties, maybe they're best symbolized by the positive mother. Because they're not going to blow you into pieces, just because, you know, because you've encountered a small error, and you'll learn something from it, and it won't be very costly. You might even be interested in it. And then I think as you go higher up the hierarchy, it's likely that the positive mother representation is going to shade into the negative mother representation, because what's happening is if you get hit at a high level of abstraction, is that it's going to start to demolish larger and larger portions of your personality structure. And then maybe at the very top, the thing that would demolish that is, is this. It's this. For the same reason that this is the thing that would eat you if you went too far away from your tribe. <clears throat> or this is the thing that would eat you if you moved too far away from the fire. Or if you fell out of the tree. You know, or the thing that would slither along the branches and swallow you, or maybe swallow your offspring millions of years ago. Now you might think, well, is there, you know, is there any reason to presuppose that those experiences left traces on us? Well, I think, I think I actually think that the propositions that psychologists started with, and this happens very frequently, are backwards. I think the onus is on people to prove that our minds aren't structured by our biological and evolutionary past, rather than that they are. I mean, the whole bloody physiology is structured, the entire, you know, the body in which the mind, the body the mind inhabits is structured by evolutionary processes. Um, you know, we know that there are certain sets of pretty formulaic cues that men and women use to evaluate each other, and those don't seem to be learned in any important way, although learning can modify them. We know that, you know, we, we don't, we're not born able to speak a language, but we are born able to babble the phonemes of all languages. So I don't know if you know that, but when a baby's laying in their crib and they're babbling, they're capable of babbling virtually every noise human beings use in all of their languages. And then what happens is that they lose the ability to babble all the phonemes that aren't used in that language, and then it's very difficult, often, for an adult to either learn to hear or to say those phonemes. So, so babies are obviously born prepared to learn a language, and it's not like we actually teach them to speak, right? You know, we might make minor corrections now and then and, and tell them how to say a word, but most of the time they just pick it up by observing, and they do it very rapidly, and, and they're incredibly good at it. So, clearly that's biologically prepared, because no other animal does it, and you can't get other animals to do it, really, except maybe parrots. Um, African gray parrots turn out to be extraordinary language users. Um, but... Other animals, you don't get very far with them. You, you might get to the word level or maybe to the simple sentence level. You know, and people have claimed that chimps have got up to the th three-year-old level. But, but obviously you're pushing a rock up a steep hill. It's not, it's not a straightforward thing for an animal to pick up language like a human being. Just, you know, you just drop them in there and poof, away they go. So obviously there's something about us that's prepared for that. And of course, we can talk. And I don't know if you know this, but our whole breathing apparatus is oddly designed to allow us to talk. And we can control our breathing very well um, compared to most animals. We can hold our breath and we can exhale. And it, it actually, the modification actually makes us slightly more prone to choking when we eat because most animals can't do that. But because of the peculiar way our throat and our, um, our, our, I don't remember the name of it, unfortunately. Yeah, and brachial, brachial tubes. The, the way their throat, I guess. No, that's wrong. Yes, yes. The way those are arranged, they, they kind of conflict with each other now and then, and that can't happen in animals. So our, not only are we prepared mentally to speak, but we're to, to, to learn language, but we're prepared physiologically to speak. And that means we have tremendous control over our tongue, and we have tremendous control over our lips, and, 
and our breathing and all of those things. So it's kind of hard to believe, you know, that we'd have this whole physiology that's evolved to be devoted to language without having a biological substrate for language somehow as part of our biological mental makeup. And, you know, with regards to the relationships between the sexes, I mean, sex is very old. Sexual differentiation is exceptionally old. The probability that we're not evolved to that is it's zero. So, so <clears throat> I'm going to show you another picture. I want to tell you a little bit about this one first, I guess. <clears throat> so this symbol means a lot of things. Well, first of all, it's a, a dragon. It's a serpent, so it's a snake. But it's, it's, it, it's also a lizard. It's a predatory thing. And it's, it can breathe fire. That's one of the characteristics of a dragon. And fire is a transformative substance. And it's a very mysterious substance. And one of the things you might note about fire is, what happens when you're sitting around a campfire? What do you look at? The fire, right? You can't not look at a fire. It's like a baby. If there's a baby in the room, a two-year-old, you're going to look at that two-year-old. You can't keep your eyes off. It's like a flickering TV. And fire is like that for people. We can't keep our damn eyes off it. And I think the reason for that was that we're all descended from the first creature who decided that he was going to play around with fire. Far more, you know, he probably came home with his fur all burnt off when he was a, an adolescent, you know. And his mother said, are you out there playing with fire again? It's like, yeah, I can't help it. You know, it's a <laughs> mutation that made it impossible for that creature to become accustomed to fire. It was fascinated by it. And, you know, once we had fire, there was no stopping us. So the probability that we're all descended from arsonist apes is extremely high. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Yes, no, no doubt, no doubt. Insane fire-wielding chimpanzees, that's our ancestors. So, so, and fire is a transformative substance, right? It's, it's, this strange, it's this strange mode of material. If you put something in it, it turns into something else, which is very, very cool, and you know, which is also extraordinarily useful, as it turns out. So, the fire, fire is a, fire is not only a transformative Phenomena, but it can be used to represent other transformative phenomena. So the dragon is something that's innately attractive for a whole variety of reasons. It can breathe fire. It's very predatory. It's also, it's also an infinite creature, and that's why it has its tail in its mouth. It's, it's self-contained. It needs nothing else. It's, and this is where the, the symbol starts to stretch beyond the representation of the predator to the representation of the unknown as such. You know, so one of the things you might wonder if you're a human being is, well, what is the unknown like? And you might think, well, why do you have to understand that? And the answer is because horrible things come leaping out of the unknown all the time. And so then you might ask, well, is it better to figure out how to deal with each of those horrible things? Or is it better to learn how to deal with the source of all those terrible things, which would be the unknown itself? Now, you remember Tiamat in the Mesopotamian myth, when she went to war against Marduk, she was sort of in the background, it created all sorts of monsters, and then they all went to battle against Marduk. So I'm going to tell you a dream that my nephew had, and I think this is a good way of representing what this symbol means. Now remember, human beings abstract. And so what we're trying to do is to look at singular phenomena and abstract out what's common across them so that we can learn to deal with the common things so that we can apply it to the entire set of those things instead of having to... And, you know, we, we know in some sense, possibly, that human beings can do this and animals can't. And so I went and heard Temple Grandin speak at one point. And I don't know if you know who Temple Grandin is, but she's probably the most accomplished autistic professor and she has she has built when she was a small child she learned that if she built this enclosure that kind of tightened in on her that it would calm her down and she she applied the things she learned that would calm her down to calming down cattle when they're being when they're being held in pens prior to being slaughtered and so She's redesigned all the cattle handling facilities, or many of the candle, ca 
cattle handing, handling facilities in the United States to keep the animals calm. And one of the things she's designed is this kind of spiral enclosure so the cows can't see what's in front of them, basically. And it's fenced in because if, if cows are going down a, uh, an enclosed area, like an alley, and there's a Coke can lying in the middle of it, they'll all stop and look at the Coke can. Or they'd stop and look at a briefcase. They're kind of freaked out by these things. And if they're walking down an enclosure and it's open and there's a windmill or something spinning off to the side, they'll stop and look at that, too. Now, Temple Grandin thinks that she thinks like an animal, which is why she thinks that she can figure out how animals think. And one of the things she said, I remember her, her, her presentation. She said, okay, so if I say to you, church, what do you see in your mind? Just anybody tell me. What, what's, the, what's the prototypical church? How, how, would, what, how would it appear? Yeah. Okay, okay. Does that seem reasonable to people? What, 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 pop, what popped into your minds when I said that? Church bells. Okay. Okay. Stained glass. Okay. Okay. Now, when Temple Grandin thinks of church, she doesn't think of church. She thinks of a church. She can't abstract out the commonalities across churches. And she thinks that's partly why autistic people have a hard time learning language. Because for an autistic person, there aren't, there isn't the prototypical church. There are just churches. And she thinks that's how animals see. They see the particulars. They don't see the abstracted universals that unite the, the particulars. And of course, that makes sense if you think about it. And, you know, one way of thinking about that too is that until you can abstract out the the commonalities across a class of phenomena, and maybe you have to do that in an image, you can't talk. Because you can't use the word church unless what you do when you receive the word church is apply it to a class of phenomena, you know, that, that may have very little in common from a visual perspective. I mean, just think about how different a given church looks from different angles. Now, I don't know if you know about the autistic there are artistic savants who can draw like mad. And so, you can see some of these people on YouTube. I mean, one guy is just absolutely, he's so amazing, it just staggers the imagination. They can fly him across the city in a helicopter, and then he can go home, and on this huge piece of paper, draw the whole city. He, can, he only has to see it for about an hour, and he can draw the windows and like everything, and there are artistic people who can figure out how many windows are on a building with one glance. They don't see things the same way we do. They don't see the abstractions. And animals don't seem to either. And the reason I'm telling you that is because you've got to understand the process of abstraction before you can understand what symbols mean. Now, what Jung believed that a symbol did was exactly what I just described, which was that there's a class of phenomena that we're struggling to understand. And the way that we build our first representations of it is an image. Just like you had the image of a church. And then you, you, can, you can label that image with a word. And then you can use the word and that will evoke the image and that will evoke the class of phenomena. But part of the reason that, he, that normal, so to speak, human beings can't draw is because when they draw, they don't draw. They draw hieroglyphics. So think about, you know, you think a child's drawing of a person is very primitive. You know, head, stick, 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 stick. Maybe they put little circles on the feet or something. And you think, well, that's, you know, pretty primitive. It's like, that's wrong. That's really, really sophisticated. It's ridiculously sophisticated that a, that a child can figure out how to schematize a person with, like, five sticks and a circle, and then they, they know that's a person, and that you do too. That's amazing. That's not primitive. Now, the autistic savants, they, they seem to draw, they seem to be able to draw so damn accurately because they don't see the abstraction, they just see the particularity. So another really interesting phenomena that goes along with autistic drawing is sometimes you'll see, remember this girl who could draw horses like mad. She lost the ability later when she picked up language. But she could start with any part of the horse. She could start by drawing the tail, you know, which is not how a normal person 
would draw a horse at all. You know, first of all, you'd sort of center it on the paper, and then you, maybe you'd sketch it in, and like it's work. You just don't start somewhere and like draw out a whole horse. And her horse drawings were like Michelangelo quality. They're remarkable. So, so this symbol, I think, this is the symbol that people were using, or that are, ah, that we use, to represent the ultimate unknown. And the ultimate unknown is a very difficult thing to represent. And so this, this symbol is making a case, and the case is, well, it's something like fire, because it's a transformative substance, and it's something like a predatory reptile, because it lurks in places where you don't expect it to lurk, and it can consume you. And, not, and it's also something like a spirit or a bird of the air, because it has wings. And, and why that is? Well, maybe that's because things come swooping down that you don't expect. I mean, there's lots of pr primates, small primates, that are attacked fairly frequently by predatory birds. And so the air is another place where the unknown can emerge. But the air is also sort of the place of spirit, and the ground is sort of the place of matter. And so this symbol here is a representation of the conjoined union of spirit and matter. And I'll, I'll talk about that a bit later, because that's a very, very complicated idea. And, okay, now, I'm going to tell you my nephew's dream. So... He, he was about five, and he was having nightmares. And during the day, night terror, so he'd wake up screaming. And when people asked him what the problem was, he didn't know, which is quite common with night terrors with children. But, you know, you could kind of infer that he was having terrible visions at night. Okay, so anyways, during the day, he was running around with a plastic night hat and a, and a sword, and uh, playing night. And... You know, and you might think, well, why would he play night? It's like, well, it's, I don't know exactly why he would play night. But, you know, he'd watch Disney cartoons and that sort of thing. And he'd been exposed to a fair bit of media. So his little brain was picking up archetypes in some sense. And he was acting them out, trying to figure out what they meant. And, you know, he's a pretty smart kid. And when he went to bed, he'd put the sword and the little night hat beside him. And then, you know, regardless, he, he was having night terrors. Now, there were... There were some problems in his family at that point, and a divorce happened relatively soon after. So there were things lurking under the surface around him, and he was also preparing to go to kindergarten, which is definitely, you know, when you take a step out into the broader world, whatever that happens to be. So he was surrounded by unknown things. Um, so one night when I was there, he had night terrors, and he came to sit at the table with his family and, and my family, and um, I asked him if he had dreamed about anything, and he said, he got very intense, and he said, yes, I was out in this field, and I was surrounded by these little dwarfs that were, just only came up to my knees, and they didn't have any arms, and they, they, they had a huge beak, like this, and they were covered with hair and grease, and on the top of their head there was a cross shaved in them, and they had big, strong feet and legs, and when I was walking around, these things would jump at me and bite me with their beaks. And we, the breakfast table got very quiet when he said that, as you might imagine. It's a pretty horrifying vision, really, you know. And, uh, and you know, you could think, well, that's why he's waking up screaming. It's like, you know, little... beak dwarfs are, like, <laughs> gnawing on him at night. It's like, that's, that's reason to be freaked out. So I said, what could you do about that? And now you see, that, that's an interesting question. Because, you know, you often think that when you ask someone a question, they provide you with the answer. But it's not exactly right, because when you ask them a question, you also provide them with the seed of an answer. And you can't help that, which is why it's very difficult not to lead witnesses in a trial, and it's also very difficult to interview children. Because every time you ask them a question, you're inevitably hinting about what you want the answer to be. But I, I was doing that on purpose, and what I was telling him was, it's hypothetically possible that a creature like you could do something about that, and if such a creature could do something about that, what would it do? So I was introducing, really what I was doing was introducing the idea of the hero to him. It's like you're beset on all sides by monstrous enemies, what's the appropriate response? Well, I do know if you have a client who has nightmares, 
you can get them to envision the nightmare. So you say, sit down, close your eyes, bring the images back to mind. And some people are really good at this. I think my experience has been that women are better at it than men. And women are somewhat more open than men on the openness dimension. Maybe that's why they like fiction better, too. But anyways, because women like fiction and men like nonfiction, roughly speaking. I mean, there's lots of overlap. But if you have a client who has a nightmare, and you have them bring it to mind, you can get them to change the ending. But it has to be some, in some quasi-realistic manner. So I had a client once who, she had two fears at the same time. She was afraid of mice. She was particularly afraid of mice running up her leg, which they will do. But she was also afraid of being attacked and raped in a cabin that she had that was north of, this was Montreal, north of Montreal. So there was a Freudian connection between the mouse fear and the rape fear. We treated her mouse phobia with exposure. I took her to McGill and, and where the rat labs were, and you know, first of all, she just kind of peered in at the rats, and then she got closer, and you know, we just did graduated exposure. And finally, she picked up a rat and petted it, and all the same day, by the way, and so that was quite, she was quite happy about that. Direct behavior, tre behavioral treatment, exposure, right? And then with the, with the whole cabin thing, what we did was first of all suggest that she get a decent lock and maybe an alarm because she was up there alone and, you know, what the hell. Part of her fear might have been predicated on an observation that she was at risk that was higher than it might be appropriate to be. I didn't know, but you might as well err on the side of conservatism. And that maybe she could bring a dog up there. That might be helpful too. So that was the practical addressing of the problem. But she had these dreams where some guy would break in in the window and, you know, rape her. And so we had her bring the, I had her bring the dream to mind, and then we'd armed her with various things. So one thing was a bat, and another thing was some rope, and another thing was a can of oven spray. And so when the guy jumped in, she sprayed him with the oven spray and hit him with the bat and then tied him up. And she was like, so she visualized this quite intently, and she was pretty damn happy about the whole visualization, you know. Um, and I think it was because it put her in the role of, of, you know, person able to defend herself rather than in the role of helpless victim. Anyways, that was the end of her nightmares. And that's not actually very uncommon. Um, I had another client who, she was walking down a beach in her dream, and on the beach above the dunes, there was this man who had a big boa constrictor, and he was showing it to the crowd, and she just walked on by. And... Uh, she was facing a variety of very difficult things, and I said, well, you know, all those other people were curious about looking at the snake. Maybe you could look at the snake. And she said, well, I think that the person who's handling the snake is a, is a charlatan and a phony, and I didn't want to have anything to do with it. So I said, well, let's, let's play with the dream a bit. And so she closed her eyes, and we went into it. And I said, now, I want you to go up there and just... Take, take a look at the snake. Get closer. She says, I'm afraid that the crowd will make me touch the snake. So that's interesting, eh? Because what that meant was she was afraid that if she associated with people, that she would be forced by peer pressure to engage in things that she was afraid of doing. So she was, she was afraid of the crowd and its attitude. And I said, okay, well, if people ask you to do that, you just tell them that, you know, Thanks very much, but I'm not comfortable with that. It's enough for me to look at the snake, and, you know, probably they'll back off. And so she did that, and they backed off. And so then she was watching, and this is active imagination. Jung would call this active imagination. She was watching the guy handle the snake, and she said, you know, because the fantasy was continuing like a daydream, and she said, well, he's not a charlatan at all. He knows how to handle these, these snakes, and he's out here on the beach to show other people how to handle snakes safely, and he's actually a good guy. And I thought, well, that's pretty damn interesting, because a snake handler, like a snake handler is an archetypal messiah, fundamentally. So, so I told you those stories. Back to, my, back to my little nephew now. All right, so beat things, jumping on them. I said, well, what could you do about that? And he, he kind of perked up which is an interesting postural adjustment, because eh? he was sort of like this before, and then he perked up, and his eyes got kind of bright. So he's excited about this idea, and I think that was activation of the approach systems, right, rather than the, the, the freezing and retreat system. So he sits up, his eyes get bright, he's excited. He says, I would take my sword, and I would get my dad. Oh, sorry, I'm missing one key element. 
after he told us about the beaked monsters, he said, there's a dragon behind them. And the dragon is puffing out smoke and fire, and every time it puffs out smoke and fire, the smoke turns into the beaked dwarfs. And so it's a big problem, right? Because you got all these beaked dwarfs around, and you're going to be fighting them off, hypothetically, but there's an infinite supply of beaked dwarfs, because there's a dragon behind it that is like puffing up all the beaked dwarfs. So what the hell are you going to do about that? And I knew that that was like a Hydra story. It's an old story. A Hydra is this multi-headed snake, and if you cut off one head, seven more heads grow. It's like, that's a problem. <laughs> it's a problem. Apparently, you're supposed to drop a very large rock on a Hydra. Because cutting the heads off it isn't going to be helpful. And, you know, there's, it doesn't take a tremendous amount of imagination to notice that what that story means is that sometimes when you solve a problem, you bring on seven more problems, right? And that's actually life, because very few things that we provide solutions to don't generate a host of new problems. You know, like the car is a really good example of that. You know, because we like to think that the car is a thing to get from one place to another in, but it could turn out that what a car actually is, is a, an entity that transforms cities and also the atmosphere. Right. So, or maybe it's the assembly line that's not just an assembly line. Maybe this assembly line is the thing that transforms cities by making cars and also fills the atmosphere with carbon dioxide and then we all die. Right, that's a big problem. So, at least hypothetically, it's a big problem. So, so it's not, it's always the case in life that when you move forward in one direction, and even if you solve a problem, that doesn't mean you've solved the problem of problems. And the, the best solution to a problem isn't the solution to a problem. The best solution to a problem is the solution to the problem of problems. Right? It's a category. How best to face the world if the world's composed of problems? All right, so, there's this dragon. And that's when I said, what could you do about that? And he said, I would, I, would, I would take my sword and I'd go get my dad, and then I'd go jump on the dragon's head. And then I'd poke both of its eyes out with the sword, and then I'd go right down its throat to where the firebox was, and I'd cut off a piece of the firebox, and I'd make a shield. And I thought, way to go, kid! <laughs> Perfect, right? Because what he, what he did was so perfect. First of all, he went right to the source of the problem, right? Right to the heart of the matter. Right down the dragon's throat. Perfect, perfect. And then the best part about it was, though, that, was that he cut a piece of the firebox off so that he could use that as a shield. It, it's so brilliant. And the reason it's brilliant, <coughs> it's brilliant on multiple levels, but the first reason it's brilliant, and the most important one, is that it is possible that if you confront a dragon, that you will obtain a shield. And that that's like the story of humanity, right? If we face down our predators, if we confront the unknown instead of running away, if we explore and voluntarily, it turns out that every time we encounter a problem, we can extract out a solution. And that solution might be a solution for all sorts of things, rather than just a solution for that problem. And so, we've had to learn that the problem is a is, is also the place that generates solutions. So, there's nothing more informative than a problem. Now, the problem is that a problem might kill you. That's a problem. But, so it's not like we have been able to make the problem disappear, but we've come up with a pretty damn good way of dealing with them. It's like, confront the damn problem and figure it out. And what do we do? We ex what do we do then, from that? What are we extracting? Well, he extracted out a shield, and of course that would protect him from the fire, because it was made out of the firebox. It's like, good work, kid. When we confront a problem, what we extract out is information. And we use the information, we use the information, we build with it, we learn new things about it. And so, you can conceive of a problem as a place of information. Now, it's, it's, more, it's, worse, it's worse than that. It's, that's not sufficient conceptualization, because it's a place of information that has this nature. You know, you, you, can't get a, you can't just turn it into an abstract issue, because the place of information is also the place of horrible, predatory, matter-spirit reptile. It's, it's all tangled together in one thing. We use the systems that we've evolved to identify, rapidly identify, predatory reptiles, 
but predators of all sorts, but predatory reptiles for the point of this argument. Once we became capable of abstraction, we used the same damn system to represent problems. Abstract problems. You know, because we know how evolution works, it's a conservative business. Once you lay the platform for one kind of perception or cognition, and then you transform that, you, you increase its power and generalizability, you have to build it on the same platform. You know, it's like the continuous generation of new versions of Windows. You've already got the infrastructure in place. You can't just demolish everything completely and build it from scratch. You know, we have the same body plan as reptiles and mammals and birds and, and whales and not fish, but, you know, that's a, that's a pretty wide range of things that basically have the same skeleton we do. So evolution is a very conservative process. Now, my nephew intuited that if you confronted the heart of the problem, you could extract out something that would protect you from the problem itself. And that's what human beings do, right? We're always on the frontier. Some of us are on the frontier. And the front, there's always a frontier, you know. We conceptualize the frontier as the place where our knowledge ends. So, you, there are journals called Frontiers of Neurology. And we also think about that as the cutting edge, right? That's, well, what's it cutting into? Well, it's cutting into Tiamat, that's one way of thinking about it. It's, it's sort of a variant of Plato's idea that you cut nature at the joints. There's a knife-like element to it. Um, well, and, that, and that's partly because, of course, you do use a knife to cut things up so that you can figure out what they are. You know, it's, 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 the symbols are as grounded in reality as they can possibly be. They're not, as Jung pointed out, the symbols aren't trying to make things hard. They're trying to make things we don't understand easy. And so the symbol stands, when you get out to the frontiers, all you've got when you look past the frontiers into the abyss is the symbol. And the symbol is created by the parts of your mind that are capable of sort of groping blindly in the darkness and formulating monstrous representations of what might be there as first-pass approximations of what it is. And then, of course, you, you refine that, and you refine that, and you refine that, and at some point it gets so refined that you can articulate it, and you can lay it down in a mathematical theory, and you can control it. But to begin with, it starts like that. It starts like that. Now, there's a matter-spirit element here, and there's an informational element. So, I think the best way to approach that is to think about it from a Piagetian perspective. Now, Piaget was a constructivist. So, this is how he thought children learned things. They would run through a routine that they'd mastered. They started out with just basic reflexes. So there were things they could do as soon as they're born. For example, they can, they can, they can take in milk. And that also helps them establish an initial relationship with the mother. And their eyes are roughly focused, insofar as they're focused at all, about the same distance that the mother's face would be from their eyes if they're breastfeeding. And they're capable of some movements, and their tongue and their mouth are pretty wired up. And they get control of their eyes relatively quickly. So, and then they start to experiment with these reflexes. You know, they can kind of fling their arms around because they myelinate from the center outward. So they start out undifferentiated, basically, and then they differentiate outward and become more and more articulated, articulated. And they learn to experiment with their basic reflexes and modify them. And, you know, it's like, think about when, when, you're, when you're first learning to dance, you kind of clunk around, you know, you, you, lose, you use low resolution movements. And those are often, by the way, controlled more by your right hemisphere. Once they become high resolution and extremely skilled movements, they start to be more controlled by your left hemisphere. So you, start a, you sort of start out like Frankenstein, you know, and you end up like Nureyev if you're, if you're fortunate. So, although you probably don't, you probably stay more like Frankenstein, or at least I do. So. Now, what Piaget pointed out was that, now, and you, you want to remember that Piaget was mostly interested in figuring out how people figured out things. That was his primary goal, and underneath that, by the way, was the goal of uniting science with religion, which is something that hardly anybody knows about Piaget, but he stated it bluntly and actually wrote a novel about it. Anyway, so he was curious about how people figured out things, and so his notion was that it, 
a child would be lumping along with its sort of low resolution psychomotor schema and it would do something that it didn't expect now I don't know how many of you are really familiar with babies but they have a remarkable startle response eh? so if you have a relatively new baby and you blow on it it just goes like this you know it's really it's really amazing it has a full body startle you know it's quite cool so they're very capable of being surprised by things and so you know maybe they're laying in their crib and they're looking at a, a mobile up there if you buy your child a mobile by the way it should be black and white and you shouldn't hang the damn things this way right because the child actually is going to is looking up so people buy their children mobiles all the time and from the child's perspective they just look like lines hanging in the air it's like no no they're supposed to be facing down so keep that in mind so anyways the baby's lying in the crib you know and it's looking at things and it's sort of moving around in like like this because it hasn't got great control of itself sorry about that and maybe it whacks the mobile you know, so it's pretty it goes, whacks the mobile and goes like this it's like, that was not what it expected and then, from Piaget's perspective what would happen is the child would try to do that again because it was interesting So, in some sense, the first interaction with the mobile was quasi-random, you know, because it, it doesn't really know what it's doing. But then, maybe its foot kicked the mobile and something interesting happened, so then the child tries to see if it can organize itself to give that thing a kick again. And then, maybe it'll practice that. You know what kids are like, man. They will obsessively practice something. So, when my daughter was young, probably 18 months old, we gave her these uh, Disney books, and they were they were hardback, they were only about this big and maybe ten pages, and there was like five of them that fit in a little box well, it turned out not to be so easy to put them in the box and so she probably spent oh god, forty hours picking up a little hardcover thing and putting it in the box, and then picking up another and getting them all in, and then she'd shake them all out, and then she'd do it again And you might think, well, what was she doing? Well, she was sharpening up her putting things into things ability which is a pretty good ability because you're going to be doing a lot of that throughout your entire life and so by practicing that, that's how she built up that that particular subset of transferable skills okay, so then you might think well, exactly what was that box of books for her? how would you conceptualize it? No, because if you look at it, you say, well, that's a box of books. It's like, no, it's not. It's a box of books for you. But for her, it was something else. It was a, it was a phenomena that enabled her to extract out information about how to organize her motor activity. And so, you know, so then I could say, well, to the degree that you think it's a book, a box of books, you're just blinded by your own presuppositions it was far more than that for her and it's quite interesting, you see this with kids all the time you know, you buy them, you buy them uh, a toy for one purpose you know, you buy them a big toy and then they play in the box so, so you know, and it was interesting when we had little kids because they would go around and they do weird things with things all the time so we got milk in milk bottles at that point and the milk bottles had these like foil wrappers on them, and my daughter would always use those as suns in her, you know, little house drawings. And so she'd be she'd walk around and take things that we'd already categorized as a certain kind of thing, and she'd do something completely different with it. That's that's in part lack of latent inhibition. The fact that she hadn't categorized the thing meant that it was polyvalent. There was many things that you could do with it, instead of the thing that you do once you categorize it. So Piaget basically conceptualized the unexpected event as a source of new two things as a source of new matter, roughly speaking and as a source of new spirit, roughly speaking why? well, first of all, the novel thing would attract your attention and then second, as you're interacting with it 
you're doing two things, just like Marduk, so this little Marduk baby in the crib it's like, by whacking the things with its hands, it starts to conceptualize their function as a defined and categorized entity right, because you get a sense of, I mean, imagine, imagine this, it's like, let's say your eyes are closed and you have a basketball, and there's a pillar in a room and you're trying to figure out what's in the room, and all you can use is the basketball, but you can move around you could bounce the basketball off that pillar a lot and sooner or later you develop a visual image of it, right? it's a low resolution investigative tool, a basketball but you could still use it if you're bouncing off it, so to speak you can build up a representation of it and so, from the Piagetian perspective, that's how a child builds up the representation of the world that's how it creates the world, it creates the material world for itself that way, by banging up against it and, and at the same time, it's learning how to bang up against it in ever better ways so the unknown, which is the thing that attracts the child's attention, can be best concept, so imagine this here's another, here, so, the child is surprised by a mobile that it kicks, the child is surprised when it drops a, a, a clump of of baby food on the floor, the child is surprised when a glass of water tilts over, the child is surprised when he pulls a dog's tail and the dog barks, you know, the child's surprised all the time ok, so then the question is, what is the similarity between all of those surprising events? if you had to categorize the category of all surprising events, what would that category look like? well, you might think, well that's, you know, that's not an appropriate category it's like, well, it's, it's not clear that that's not an appropriate category because the category of all surprising events is exactly the category of the unknown as such and as I said before, it's better to know how to deal with the unknown as such than it is to deal with, to know, to deal with specific aspects of the unknown and that's exactly what was expressed in my nephew's dream, right? he wasn't going to fight off the little dwarfs, there was no point in it he had to go to the thing that was the source of the trouble and fight that and you know, that's how people are that's what our most archetypal stories are about so some of you are Star Trek fans, perhaps um, what's the motto of Star Trek? it's to boldly go where no one has gone before, right? and everybody's pretty happy about that, you know and it's, it's very, very basic archetypal story but it does encapsulate the human relationship with reality it's that's, we, we, we think of reality that way, we think of the known and the unknown and we think of there being a boundary between the known and the unknown and we think about being on the edge of that boundary and looking over and that's the, that's the archetype of exploratory behavior now the, the serpent symbol is even deeper than that because the serpent symbol represents the world before it's even been categorized it's like what's there when there's no one there that's what this symbol represents, it's the ultimate in the unknown, it's the source of all things and so, it's infinite and self-contained and it's matter and spirit at the same time and partly it's infinite because you never run out of an unknown things and it's, um, it's eternal because you never run out of unknown things and, and it's matter because when you interact with it you, you conjure up the material world, so to speak, in all sorts of different ways you know, sometimes by actually crafting material things and other times by merely defining the material of the space that you're in but you also extract information out of it to build yourself out of because you might say, well, where do you come from? well, part of it is, there you are, you have a biological structure but obviously we think of nurture you're extracting information from the environment all the time now, you might say, well, how do you do that? and I think there's there's a variety of ways, one is, you know, Piaget would say, well, you mimic the world with your motor apparatus apparati? Your, so, for example, when you look at the can, this is part of looking at the can, the can is a graspable object that's the can, that's how you define it, so this is like the can, and so that's a pattern insofar as it's stable in space across time, it's a pattern, and you can match that pattern and so it's a transfer of the pattern here to a transfer to the, to the pattern here and that's, that's the use of information information is information it's, it's, there's something, there's lots of different definitions of information, by the way but, but the information that we think of is inf 
information is that that you can gather that you can then use. You incorporate it, and then it's in you, and then you can use it. So insofar as you're constantly adjusting to the external world and its demands, you're, you're reproducing the pattern of the external world in your body. That's one form of representation. That's, a, that's an informed representation, and then you abstract out of that to make your abstract representations. But the point is, you're pulling the information out of it. So the unknown is the ultimate source of information. And it can be very, very dangerous. But it doesn't matter, because it's less... The, the human supposition is that the unknown is there and it's dangerous, but the best thing you can do with it is confront it voluntarily when it makes itself manifest, when you're prepared. That's your best bet. And that's, that's, that's our archetype, fundamentally. That's our bet on reality. You know, evolutionary biologists say that we occupy the cognitive niche. Well, I'm trying to do that. <laughs> I, it's okay, I will. That's what this next bit is about. So, so your question is perfectly timed. Okay, so now I want to show you this image that I forgot to put in here. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through this diagram. So, in the middle is an anomaly. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about anomaly. So, an anomaly is the unexpected that emerges when you're, when you're laying down a routine on the world. You, you, you want the world to do something, but it does something else. We've talked about that a lot. What does it do that's something else? Here's a way of thinking about it. So, The word phenomena, phenomenon, comes from a Greek word, thanesthai, and that word means to shine forth. So an anomaly is something that shines forth, and you might say, well, what does that mean to me? And I would say, well, you can watch for this, like, all you have to do is watch. In the next week, watch the things that attract your attention, because they will. There are things that will automatically attract your attention. You get interested in them. You know, or they catch the corner of your eye, and you, you have to look at them. I mean, and those are the things that are shining forth in some sense. And the idea that they're shining forth is actually quite an accurate idea, because here's a way of looking at your perception. So, you know, I mentioned that my little daughter would take all these, like, foil things and make suns out of them, but she was always making one weird thing out of something that we'd already categorized. So, here's something to think about. What do you see when you look at the world? And the answer is... Mostly you see your memory Because you're not smart enough to actually see the world, it's too damn complicated So you've spent a lot of time seeing the world And so you've built up all these representations of the world And so now when you see the world, you use the representations Because why the hell wouldn't you? It's just so hard to look at the world So once you learn to do it, you're going to use what you've learned And then what you see is what you've learned, you don't see the world and so I could all even say that as long as things are going your way, you never see the world. You only see your representations of the world. And so then you might say, well, what's behind that representation? Well, what's behind the representation is the thing that shines forth. Now, I think people experience this when they take hallucinogenic drugs. Because I think what the hallucinogenic drugs do, in part, is stop them from seeing their memories. And then they see, they see the unknown as such more, although you can never see the unknown as such. But everything that's, that's no longer 
hyper-attractive and new and, and fresh and vital revitalizes that's what Huxley reported in The Doors of Perception and we know that if you're, we know that if you're pre-exposed to a stimulus and the stimulus means nothing so first of all something pops up and it attracts your attention but then you see it again and again and again and again and again and again and again you habituate to it and then it no longer has any effect on you, it becomes invisible I don't really believe that you habituate, I think it's the wrong word you habituate if it's the kind of stimuli that your spinal cord could process you know, so if you take a snail and it comes out of its shell and you tap it, it'll go into its shell and then it'll come out and you tap it, it'll go into its shell and it'll come out you keep doing that, sooner or later you can tap the snail and it won't go into its shell and the reason is, is that the snail has figured out that tap does not imply an event that would require a snail to pull into its shell now, it hasn't done that because it's all reflex but in people, we still have those simple reflexes that can just habituate but then we have much more complex models of the world that we have to actively engage in constructing and also once we construct those, they can stop us from reacting to the stimulus now think about it, here you are in this room look at everything around you which you can't do, by the way but look at everything around you how many of those things are you reacting to? and the answer is, none, really so, I bet I could take half of you out of this room I could take all of you out of this room and half of you wouldn't know what color the room is well, I would now. <laughs> well, right, right, as long, now, because that's all of a sudden then it shines forth it's like, oh, now that has meaning again you wouldn't know what color those sound absorbing panels on the back are you probably wouldn't even know that there's, those are there you wouldn't know the color of the floor or the design on the floor you might not even know the color of the chairs and, and why would that be? It's, it's because well, why is it? why wouldn't you know, know those things that you've been exposed to so often? and part of the answer to that is and this is an interesting way of thinking about it it doesn't matter well, then you might think, well, what does matter mean? because matter is a weird word, right? because things are made out of matter right? but you can also think that things are made out of what matters? and it's actually more accurate to think of things as being made out of what matters and that what happens when you build a model of what matters is that most of it stops mattering and that's okay because, you know, you don't want to be overwhelmed by everything all the time I mean, maybe that's a paradisal or maybe a hellish experience but it kind of, it makes you non-functional there's just not enough of you to process everything all the time so you zero everything out by building a model of it and the model says, you this is zero, it's irrelevant it has no bearing whatsoever on what you're trying to accomplish in this time and place and it ceases to draw your attention now then you think, well, wait a sec not everything has ceased to draw my attention now that's a strange thing that's a strange thing you remember that little snitch thing that Harry Potter used to chase around when he was playing Quidditch? that's the unknown, by the way that's actually a symbol of the unknown it's called the winged chaos and I, I had no idea how the hell J.K. Rowling knew about the winged chaos or the round chaos is another way of, of describing because if you put round chaos into Google the only thing you get is my website now it's, it's something I took from Jung but it's pretty damn obscure but apparently she studied a lot of alchemy before she wrote Harry Potter and that knowledge consciously or not, made it into she's pretty damn smart, so it's and, but she's creative, you know, so if you're creative there's always a dance between your consciousness and your unconscious mind, a creative dance you, things emerge and you play with them, but, and they emerge and, then, and you play with them like the writers I know, their characters come alive for them and they, and they just write down what the characters are likely to do, you know and there's going to be some conscious direction, but it's this dance between unconsciousness and consciousness that really makes up creativity but anyways, you know in the Harry Potter Quidditch game, what happens when Harry gets the little ball? right, 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 so there's really two games going on at the same time, right? there's the game everyone else is playing, and then there's the game that the seeker is playing and when the seeker wins, everyone wins that's the rule in Quidditch and that's the rule when the seeker wins, everyone wins that's the rule, and that's an archetype too so 
And the round chaos, the thing that Harry's chasing, that's the coolest thing, because that was the alchemical representation of matter. And it was a container. And it contained, it's like the dragon in some sense, it contained matter and spirit. And if you caught it, then you could inculcate the matter, or the spirit, and utilize the matter. Now, back to what attracts your attention. I hate to say this, but because what attracts your attention is the same thing that Harry's chasing in the Quidditch games. It's the same thing. Now, it's the category of what attracts your attention. Now, Jung was very interested in this. He thought that what attracted your attention was a consequence of the manifestation of the higher self. The self is what he called it. The self is what you are. The ego is what you think you are. And <clears throat> it might also... That's close enough. The self is what you actually are. Well, you have no idea what you actually are because you don't know very much about yourself and you're really, 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 really complicated. And there's lots of things going on that you have no idea about and the world is a really strange place. And the self is also the thing that you are now, and the thing that you were, and the, all of the things that you could potentially become. And that's a strange idea. So, maybe you guys can help me think about this, you know, because I've, I've been thinking for a long time about these sorts of things. So there's that. You might say, well, is the unknown, is that a reasonable representation of the unknown as such? The unknown as such is the place from which matter and spirit emerges. Okay, now. You think, well, no, I'm saying that's the best definition of reality. That's the best definition, or we're going we're gonna to make that prop proposition. You say, well, no, 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 that's not right. The best definition of reality is material reality. Material reality, you can decompose it down to the elemental and the, and the atomic level, and that's objective reality, and everything else is a secondary manifestation of that. And that's the modern worldview. Although we don't and can't factor consciousness into that, but whatever it's a pretty powerful view, it's enabled us to get a lot of places so then if you're going to offer a counter position and by the way although it took me probably 30 years to figure this out there are many other people who have made this case, so Heidegger for example made the case that I'm making, and Jung made the case that I'm making, although I knew that um, so other people have wandered down this path fundamentally so it's not as idiosyncratic, as strange as you might think. What do you see, what is it that you are facing when you face the future? Now there's, there's a variety of ways of thinking about that, but let's think about how you act and how you think when you think about confronting the future. I would say, well you see the future as a field of possibilities, right? You do, that's what you do. You see the future as a field of possibilities. And you use your faculty of imagination to map potential routes through that sea of potentiality. Because you imagine that you could be A, or you could be B, you could be a plumber, you could be a lawyer, you could be a supermodel, you could be a nerd. Like there's all, there's this, there's all of these possibilities that lie open to you. And some of them are more at hand than others. In, in that you could get from here to there very rapidly so for example if you wanted to go get a drink of water in the next 10 seconds you could probably make that reality manifest itself but if you wanted to be a billionaire then it's going to take a fair bit of maneuvering to make that reality manifest itself so some are, some are there and some are far but you act as if what's your, what you're up against is possibility and then what you also act out is that you're the thing that can transform itself in response to the transformations of that possibility. And everyone believes that, even though they don't notice it. And so your parents say, live up to your potential. What in the world is that? Your potential. Now, it's weird. It seems to me it's weird. Like, it's hard to measure. I mean, if I gave you guys an IQ test, that would be some clunky way of measuring part of your potential. But it's not even easy for us to measure potential. And then you think, well, what is the stuff that we call potential? Is it... It's not the way things are, it's the way they could be. 
And they, it, it seems to be that they could be a whole bunch of ways, not just one. And so, and I, <clears throat> what seems to happen is that this field of potential collapses into a single actuality as we interact with it. Now, I should also point out that there are models propagated mostly by John Wheeler and his school. He's, he's a quantum physicist. And his hypothesis, he calls his hypothesis it from bit, bit being a piece of information. He believes that the ground of reality is basically something that's best conceptualized as information. And that when consciousness interacts with it, whatever consciousness happens to be, it transforms itself from potential to actuality. It snaps into place. And there's weird corollaries to this. So here, here's a weird, here's a bloody weird thing. This is from Wheeler. So let's say you go outside and you look at a distant galaxy. It's maybe, who knows how far it is away, it doesn't really matter. Three million light years away. You look at it, a photon hits your retina. Wheeler claims that that photon couldn't have left that star 30 million years ago unless your eye was there now to perceive it. Now that's a bloody weird thing to say. And if you don't believe me, you can look it up. I mean, I wouldn't say something like that unless I was reasonably sure that that is in fact what he would say. Wheeler believes that the quantum waveform, which is, in, I think, it's something like this horizon of potentials, doesn't become realized until it's interacted with by something that's conscious. Now, not everybody believes Wheeler, but the physicists who don't believe Wheeler believe something that's even weirder. They believe that every time a, a quantum event, so if you go down far enough into the subatomic realm, you get to events that are no longer divisible, basically. So a quantum event, for example, would be the bouncing of an electron from one shell, atomic shell, to a lower shell, in which case, if I remember correctly, it emits a photon. So the bounce is a quantum event. The electron goes from here to here, but it doesn't pass through the intervening space, however that happens, and then it releases a photon. And the photon is a quantum event. And so things are quantum because at some point you can't break them down any further. So your, your computer screen is quantized, right? Because if you get the resolution up higher, high enough, you can see the singular pixels that it's made out of, and that's it. You can't go any farther than that. So these other physicists believe that every time there's a quantum event that could go one way or could go another, that a new universe is created in which if it goes one way here, it goes the other way in that new universe. And so there's like infinite numbers of infinitely branching universes. And you might say, well, where are those? And the answer is, they don't know. They can't really detect them, in some sense. And then you might say, well, that's a hell of a theory to explain something simple by. All you do is posit an infinite number of infinite universes, and poof, you solved your problem. It's hardly an Occam's razor solution. And then you might say, well, why even bother with that theory? And part of the answer is, well, there are people that are working very hard on quantum computation. And quantum computation involves the use of these things that I don't comprehend at all, called qubits. Q-U-B-I-T-S. And a qubit is a, a state of matter that could be a variety of different states, but isn't any of those yet. And you can use those qubits to compute. But the simplest way of saying what you're doing when you're doing quantum computation is that you're using the universes that are pretty close to ours to do your computations in. So that you can get a lot more done in a lot shorter time because you're doing some things in this universe and you're doing some other things in a bunch of other universes and so that's a lot more efficient. And you might think, well, sure, but quantum computation does work. Now, there's even a company that has manufactured what they claim is a quantum computer although you can do quantum computations at very local levels, that's been demonstrated, no one doubts it, it's published in journals like Science and Nature, this actually happens. There's a company that claims that they've produced a commercial quantum computer, and people aren't sure if that's true or not, for, again, for reasons I don't understand, but the computer is capable of doing certain kinds of calculations much faster than a normal computer can. So, that's all pretty damn weird, that's for sure. Now, it seems to me, and I wrote a paper with my graduate students about this, and, you know, we were stretching our knowledge to the 
right to the end of our limits. We were trying to unite the theory of anxiety with, with thermodynamics, basically. And we published this paper in a, a journal called Psych Review, which is a very good journal. It's very hard to publish in Psych Review. It's the only paper I've ever published there. And uh, we basically proposed that when you get anxious, what you see in front of you, what you perceive in front of you, you can't actually see it with your eyes. You, it's more like you perceive it with your body, or your body perceives it. What you see unfolding in front of you is a large and indeterminate space of potential worlds, roughly speaking. And that the reason you get anxious is because all of a sudden there's all those potential worlds you have to deal with. And you didn't think that you were going to have to deal with any of them. So you might say, well, when does that happen to you? And I would say, okay, so it's 20 below, and you're late for class, and you jump in your car, and it's snowing like mad, and you drive two miles, and all of a sudden your car stops. And then you might say, well, what is it that you're sitting in now? And you will say, well, obviously I'm sitting in a car. It's like, that's by no means obvious that what you're sitting in is now a car. It could be a tomb if it's cold enough. And even if it's not a tomb, you're not where you expected to be, you're not where you want to be, and it isn't exactly clear where you are. And so that your body is going to get all, uh, I just saw a dinosaur-like. And it's an apprehension. It's a, it's a perception. It's a perception that the map that you were using to map your environment to define all the objects and to define your relationship to those objects no longer fits the territory. And so then you might say, well, if your map doesn't fit the territory, then what the hell is the territory? And the answer to that is many things, many of which you cannot control. Now, you know, you might get lucky and all that has to happen is that somebody comes and tows you along and takes you to a mechanic. But even that's going to rattle your chains because, well, if your car breaks down, how do you feel about having to take it to a mechanic? Well, mostly you don't feel good about it. And why? It's like, well, you don't know if the mechanic will find the damn problem. You don't know if you might have to get a new car. You don't know if you can trust the mechanic to tell you whether you need a new car. Maybe it's a $2 part and they, he offers to put a whole new motor in. Then you have to deal with them. You have to find a place to take it. You have to assess whether or not the shop is honest. So it's like a whole can of snakes. And part of that can of snakes is, can I... Is it the case that the mechanic to whom I take this car is the thing that he presents himself as. Now, in an honest transaction, that problem never comes up, because you just assume that the person in front of you is two-dimensional, and that you can assume that they're identical with what they say, right? That's an honest transaction. So then you're not dealing with a can of snakes, you're dealing with a, a few words. But if it's not an honest transaction, it's like, whoop, can of snakes. So. And maybe someone stops to help you on the side of the road. And you think, well, is that a good thing? Or is that a bad thing? Because the person who's approaching you in the snowstorm when it's isolated is also a can of snakes. And then there's the other snakes that come out, like, well, you aren't going to get to class, and so maybe you have an exam. And so then there's the whole, well, what happens if I miss this exam, and maybe that'll, you know... I won't do so well in this course, and then I have to go talk to the professor, and it's going to be a big mess, etc. And so I would say that what happens when your car stops on the way to school is that everything around you turns into a mass of snakes. Now, obviously, that's a symbol, right? Because it, it's not, they're not real snakes. But they're not your damn car, either. And you might, to the degree that you confuse what you're sitting in with a car, all you're going to be, be is irritated and upset, because it's going to manifest none of the features of a car. Because a car isn't a block of metal with four tires on it. A car is something you can ignore while it takes you from point A to point B. And as soon as it isn't doing that, it isn't a car. It's some bloody chunk of metal with all sorts of parts that you don't understand, that a bunch of people you don't know anything about are going to have to manipulate before it will turn back into a car at your expense. And the day that you proposed, which you had all mapped out, was quite simple. Poof! All of a sudden, it's not that day at all. And God only knows what sort of day it's going to be. 
you know, it's a, it's a perfect setup for a movie. These things happen all the time. You know, someone's car breaks down on a dark, lonely road, and, you know, God only knows who comes out of the shadows to help. It's a classic setup for a horror movie. So the question is, where are you when you don't know where you are? I would say, you're as close to reality as, ever, as you're ever going to get when you are where you don't know where you are. And it's a bit much to take. And so people do everything they can, all the time, to make sure that the amount of reality that they have to come into contact with is delimited, filtered, and controlled. And we do that a bunch of different ways. We do that by organizing our beliefs in a certain way. That's terror management theory, fundamentally, right? Is that we organize our beliefs to shield ourselves from the reality of death. But we also organize our societies and our interpersonal relationships in such a way that we're shielded from death and so that we don't kill each other. And that has nothing to do with the utility of our beliefs in keeping the fear of death at bay. That's something that keeps the lights on and keeps this room warm when it's minus 20 outside. You think, well, here we are in this room and everyone knows what this room is, but it's not the same room if someone pulls out a pistol. It is really not the same place. And insofar as you think it's the same place, all that means is you're in real trouble, because it is not the same place. So things can shift and change on you all the time, and in fact, to some degree, that's what time is doing. Okay, now, you remember the Osiris Horus story, right? Okay, so there's Osiris, and Osiris is like, he's like the way things are. Now, there's a problem with that. He's like the map. There's a problem with that, is because the territory is always moving around, and so your map is never quite up to date, and so you can't rely on Osiris. You know that if you have one of those Google GPS's. Now and then they've taken me like to the, to the middle of parking lots. You know, because the map thinks there's something there that isn't there, and it's, there's nothing there. Maybe it's not updated. It wasn't Google, it was the thing that I was using in my car. Because Google tends not to do that. But anyways, when the map isn't an accurate representation of the territory, an accurate pragmatic representation of the territory, then you can't navigate in it and you're going to end up places that you don't understand. So, the map gets out of date as the territory changes, so Osiris isn't good enough, the old map never works. It kind of works, and so you need Horus, because Horus is the thing that updates the map. It's like he's attending to those things, he's attending to those locales where the map is no longer valid, and updating it. Now, back to the idea about the things that attract your attention. It was either Bin Swanger or Boss, and unfortunately I don't remember which, because I always confuse the two, existential, phenomenological psychologists. And one of them, and I think it was Bin Swanger, said that reality shines forth, and the other one said, no, no, no. You lay a structure on reality, and the structure is what allows things to shine forth, and it doesn't matter, because you can just put those two theories together. There's something shining in the background, and you have a map that's a filter, and now and then there's a little hole in the map, and you can see the things that are shining through. Those are the things that attract your interest. Now imagine that you have a part of your brain that likes the map and just follows it, and I would say that's the automatized part of you, right? That's the part that's running on algorithms. So when you know a territory, when you're driving home the hundredth time, you hardly have to pay attention at all. Because you've paid attention a hundred times before. You know the route. You can rely on your pre-existent skills. They're built into you, literally. You've built neurological models of, of the landscape and the reaction. So, here's an example. You know, before you can be a London taxi cab driver, you bloody, you have to take a test. It takes like four years of studying. You have to know the city. And London's a big city. It isn't that you just have to know how to navigate in it, you actually have to sort of memorize the whole damn city. And so they've done scanning studies on people who've done the London cab training process, and what they find is that from the beginning of the four year, three year, whatever it is, training period, to the end, their hippocampi grow. So, well, why? Well, because they have a big map, it's a bloody big map, it's all of London. 
you know, so the reason I'm saying that is you don't want to be thinking that when you've learned a root that you've just updated your psyche, you, you know what I mean, it's not just your abstract conscious mind that knows something, you've built the damn thing right into your body you've built neural structures that, are, that, that correspond in some manner some minimal manner to the territory itself and so then you can just run on automatic and you want to run on automatic because you know, I bet you've experienced this, you, you go somewhere for the first time it, it's much longer the first time than it is the third time have you, have, has that, have you experienced that? Has, how common is that experience? Put up your hands if you've experienced that. Okay, has people not experienced that? Okay, okay, so I think the reason that is, is that you're doing a lot more neural, there's a lot more neural events going on when you're doing it the first time, and part of your time perception is how many neural events are occurring per fragment of time. And so if a lot of them are happening per fragment of time, the time is going to seem longer. If hardly any of them are happening, it's like you hardly even notice the time, and why should you? There's no point in it. You're, ru you're running on automatized machinery, so I'll say, well, that's Osiris. Then you have another piece of machinery, that's Horus. That's the thing that attends to those things that the map hasn't covered. And I would say, this is a Jungian idea, primarily, although, of course, Jung extracted it out from all these ancient stories. Where things shine through the map is what attracts your attention, and that tells you whether or not you know it, the map has a hole there, you should fix it. Now, as you fix the hole in the map, you also fix yourself. Because you're building yourself out of information. Now, a corollary of that is, you have a map of the past, your past, and there's holes in it everywhere. And you can tell where those holes are because you can't forget about them. So the hole might be, you got bullied in grade 3 and you were traumatized. It's like, that's a hole in the map, because you're still that person, unless you've repaired the hole, you're still that person. And that's never going to stop shining through for you, unless you go back there and repair it. And what that also means is, imagine that, that hole, what shines through is, is horror, in part. It's hard on you, but it's also information. It's information. And the information there would be, how the hell do you deal with a bully? And so maybe you go back and you think about that, you really think through it and you think, well how did I get bullied and why did I get bullied and exactly what it is about human nature that allows someone to be malevolent like that and what should a person do to defend themselves against that possibility and how can I become that person? It's like, poof, hole fixed. And what that means in some sense is that you've extracted out the residual information from that occurrence that you hadn't been able to, or refused to, process when you first had the experience. Now, in your brain, being no stupid thing, is it's really concerned about this map. It cares about the map and where things shine through, because it doesn't want you falling through holes. And so, every place that what you don't know shines through is either something you have to attend to now, or something you can't forget. And what you do when you forget something, you don't actually forget it you learn that it doesn't mean anything anymore because you've mastered it that's what it is to forget a traumatized person can't forget because they haven't mastered the territory that constitutes the, the locale of the trauma you know, so you might say, well let's say you're a soldier and you did something seriously brutal in Afghanistan or Vietnam like, seriously brutal um, and you can't forget it what do you do about that? well, you know, I've dealt with people who've been traumatized in one way or another sometimes by things they've done and sometimes by things that have happened to them um, in order for people to deal with a traumatic event that involved malevolence they have to develop a theory of good and evil because it's the evil and the malevolence that traumatizes them and I, I think I've told you already, I had two clients who suffered post-traumatic distress disorder because of the way someone looked at them once, it was only one time the person looked at them the other, it was repeated, this is a person who'd been bullied and it took me a while to figure out that she had post-traumatic stress disorder 
But she kept talking about the look on his face. Well, it was an archetypal look, right? It's the look of pure evil, insofar as someone can manifest that look. It's like, you can manifest that look. You know, and if you're a soldier, and you've manifested that spirit, that might be enough to knock out part of your consciousness, right? That's what happens to Horace when he encounters Seth. It's like, uh oh eyes open, you encounter something like that, you lose an eye. You pay a price, right? It can damage you because it's so deep and, and terrible. One of the things Jung said about human beings in, as such, and this is the adversarial part of the person, there's a heroic side and there's an adversarial side. He said, all of your moral flaws, your moral flaws are like, they're like the, hmm, there's an abyss underneath them. That's, that's where the image of hell comes from. Everything you do that's wrong, morally wrong, is associated with the abyss if you look into it deeply enough. One of the things Jung thought was that if you, and this is also the same with the phenomenologists, by the way, and it's also the same with Viktor Frankl, and I believe it's also the same with Alexander Solzhenitsyn when he wrote about how to stand up against totalitarian states. It's like, you have to maintain an honest relationship with the things that attract your attention. You can't ignore them. If you ignore them, well, what happens? Well, we've already figured that out. You don't fix the holes in your map, and then whenever you wander on that territory, you're going to fall right through. And when you fall through, then you're going to think, oh my God, the world's cursed. Look at all these terrible things that are happening to me. It's like, yeah, well, if you weren't wandering around with a self-imposed degenerative map, then maybe you wouldn't fall into the pits. And that's a very interesting proposition. You know, because one of the propositions is, if you read the terror management theorists, say, those guys think that you got to have a psychological theory that's pretty coherent and integral in order to protect yourself against death anxiety. And e even though in the final analysis that theory is false, it's insufficient. It's there as a defense, like a Freudian defense. Okay, and if, if not that, then you have to conceptualize yourself as a hero because that boosts your ego, makes you feel good about yourself, and you can find temporary relief in the delusional fantasy that there's something special and heroic about you. Okay. That's a materialist interpretation of archetypal reality, and it's a powerful one. That was Ernest Becker, and Becker was a smart guy, and he took Freudian theory to its ultimate limit. He never read Jung, though. It was a big mistake. Jung has a different proposition that's really, really different. His proposition is, if you extract out all the information that's available to you by paying attention to the disjunction between the territory and the map, so if you let, your, if you let what shines forth guide you and you explore it, then you'll extract out enough information from that process of exploration so that you can build yourself into something so strong that you're actually just no longer afraid of death. And there's nothing false about that. See, the Becker and the Freudians think that's impossible. They think, you know, basically, you're a, you're a sand sculpture in a hurricane. We don't know what people are. And we don't know how tough they can be. And people can be unbelievably tough. You know, I mean, think about people, for God's sake. It's like, my sister-in-law works in palliative care. You know, that's kind of rough. Everybody she works with is going to, like, they're going to die in three weeks. She does it. Is she deluded about it? You know, I, I don't think so. I talk to her. Like, she seems to be quite aware and also quite happy when her life is going well, you know, because she sees all the time what happens if it doesn't go well. It's like the whole damn bottom falls out. It's like, if, if you, I, I have a little joke that I always tell myself about this, it's like, how can you tell when you're having a good day? And the answer to that is, there isn't a crocodile attached to your leg. And that's about the right attitude, and you know, if you're dealing with something like palliative care, that's basically how you think all the time. Oh, you had a rough day at school? Oh, that's not so bad. At least there isn't a crocodile attached to your leg. You know, and I also think that that's what happens to adolescents in cultures where they undergo a really profound initiation. You know, they're taken out of their, it usually happens with the boys, and I think that's because Mother Nature blesses women with their own automatic initiation. Um, 
and they take the boys out from their mothers often their mothers are all crying and unhappy about this and some of that's ritual and some of it's true because they're going to lose their child and they take the kids out, the boys out, and they, like, they just scare them to death you know, they bury them, they put them, in a, they put them in a cave I don't know if you've ever been in a cave with the lights off, but I can tell you a cave is very dark, and you can imagine, imagine sitting in a cave for two days okay, now, you might say, well, what's in that cave? And the answer to that is, who knows, right? Spiders, snakes, whatever, cave monsters, whatever. But I can tell you one thing that's in that cave, and that's your imagination. And believe me, you're going to confront that sucker with two days inside a cave. You're going to wonder, well, are they ever going to come back and get me? I'd be wondering that. It's like, what if the roof caves in? What if this is an evil trick? And then you think, well, what are, what are all the things that could be in that cave? Well, whatever is really in that cave is, is certainly not going to be any more horrible than the things that you might imagine could be in that cave. So, you know, in some sense, an initiation like that is a confrontation with the ultimate horrific limits of imagination. And my suspicion is, if you get through that, I mean, and there's more to the initiation ceremony than that, because you also get inculcated with the tribe's customs and beliefs at the same time. You know, so you're stripped bare in some sense, and then rebuilt as an adult. I think part of what that initiation does is show you the difference between things you should be worried about and things you shouldn't be worried about. And it isn't clear to me that you can have your nervous system calibrated properly until you've taken yourself right to the edge. Because then you know what's frightening and what isn't. And there's every reason to believe that we have no idea how courageous people can be. You know, they can be insanely, ridiculously courageous. And I, I think palliative care work is a good example of that. You know, caring for the dying, that's... You know, I think that people who work in funeral homes are like that. And they, they seem to manage it, you know. I mean, I've talked to people who work in funeral homes. I said, well, like, how the hell can you stand doing this? They say, well, it really makes me appreciative of my life. Isn't that interesting? Well, you know that, that diagram I showed you with the stacks, there's a square, it has a little dragon on it, and then there's a disc that's the great mother, and then there's another disc that's the great father, and then there's a disc inside that's the, the hero. Those are, those are, it's a map of the way things shine through forth to some degree, you know, because I think the background is illuminated, the background of things is illuminated, so to speak, and then we place what is essentially a social structure on top of that. Part of that's conceptual and perceptual, and part of it's actually out in the world. So, you know, when we're all sitting here, just sitting here, you know, we're all keeping the tremendous potential that we all have for one thing or another, we're all keeping that under really tight control, and we're all doing it in exactly the same way. So basically, the polite way to act in a situation like this is as if you're something that can be safely ignored. Now, the thing is, you have a map of the social world just like you have a map of the natural world. There is the social world, and you have a map of it. And there is the natural world, and you have a map in it, of it. So the thing is, novelty in the social world can also shine forth. Now, here's, here, you, have, you see what you think about this. So, so, let's say you fall in love with someone. Okay, and you think, well, the, clearly that's a delusional state. Because... Well, it fades, usually, and, uh, you know, often what happens in a relationship is that the person is sort of illuminated, that, that would be the effect they have on you when you're infatuated or when you're in love, and then, you know, you learn all the ways that they don't quite match that, maybe, or you habituate to them, or, you know, the, the relationship accumulates a tremendous number of errors, and then that disappears, and you think, well, that was just, like, that's an instinct, and you're the victim of it. 
You have to fall in love like that, you have to be stupid like that, because otherwise men and women wouldn't be attracted to each other and that would be the end of it. But, it, but it's an illusion, maybe it's a chemically induced illusion. Okay, that's one way of looking at it, but here's another way of looking at it. Now, I'm going to switch it a little bit. It's one thing, you'll, the women in the class will particularly experience this, although men can experience it too, but I think it's something that's particularly granted to women. So, let's say you see someone else's baby. Okay, well, most women, and some men, are quite interested in babies, you know, so they'll go up, they like to interact with them, they're, they're attracted to babies, so... But, being attracted to someone else's baby is nothing like seeing your own baby, like, those are, like, those are cataclysmically different experiences. And I think the reason for that is, the only baby you can actually see is your own. For everyone else's baby, you just see your representation of a baby, and the real baby shines through a little bit, but not very much. But what you're blessed with if you have a child, and I think this probably is a consequence of a biochemical transformation, is that the memory structures that you would use to process that child as a known object disappear. And all you see is the baby, it's like, and that's the same idea as the archetypal infant, you know, the archetypal holy child. You know, and it's certainly possible that each infant is an archetypally holy child, but the only person that can see that is the mother. And then you might say, well, is that true? Is that an archetypally holy child? Well, one answer to that might be, it depends on how you treat it. You know, if you treat it as if it's an archetypally holy child, then it has a pretty good chance of developing into one. So, and, so then let's, let's switch that a bit and think about a relationship that you would have with someone when you fall in love. One possibility is that you're deluded. The other possibility is, you get the chance briefly to see what that person could be like, if you interacted with them in the most perfect way you could. So it's like a glimpse, it's like a glimpse into a, a potential, extraordinarily positive future. So, the vision emerges, and then it shuts. And then it's up to you to build it, to make it happen. To take what you've seen and transform it into reality. Now, that doesn't mean I don't think that people can be deluded about their partner. I think they're deluded about their partners all the time. I think part of the reason for that is that we build corrupt maps. And we do it on purpose. And to the degree that you've built a corrupt map, then the things that shine forth aren't even going to be in the right place. So, one of the corollaries, and we're going to talk about this a lot near the end of the class, that is if you're going to follow the things that shine forth, you better make sure you're not looking at the world with flawed machinery. Because my suspicions are that for someone like Jeffrey Dahmer, for example, the things that shone forth were not exactly the things that you would like to follow. You know who Jeffrey Dahmer was? Does it... Oh, he was a brutal serial mur murderer. Yeah, yeah, he was... And, you know, in, in many situations like that, when someone is oriented towards extraordinarily brutal crimes, the brutality of the crime increases with time. The brutality of the crime increases. It starts with, it often starts with the torture of animals. And then it proceeds. And there's no stopping it. Like, God only knows where it would go. And, I mean, it, it's bad enough, so one character like that, John Wayne Gacy, he was a clown. He was quite the character. When they finally caught him, he asked to be killed. So, you know, the shine forth thing is a kind of a tricky business, because, you know, there's a line in the Old Testament, or the New Testament, that says something like, test the spirits to be sure, to be certain that they are from God. It's something like that. But, you know, if you're looking at things in a crooked way, what shines forth might not be the thing that's best for you. So there's this, like, there's this parallelism. So if you're going to take the risk of having a life that's governed by meaning, let's say, you bloody well better make sure that you're not lying to yourself. Because all that'll happen then is that you'll follow a blind person and you'll both fall into a pit. Okay, so let's take a break.